So great, I'm Melissa Taylor. I'm the host <laughs> for this meeting. Um, we'll let Dr. Orocho introduce herself and take it away. Thank you so much, Lisa. I am very excited to be here today to share with you all this, this very, very new research uh, that I'm working on. So thank you all for being here. This has been kind of a fun project because I'm learning a completely new research method as I study students who are in research methods classes. So it's giving me a little bit of insight from that side as well. So this research is examining the development of attitudes in behavioral science research methods students is the, the boring title. But this is a quote from one of the students in my summer class. Actually, you can have a lot of fun with it in reference to research methods. And so that's what kind of inspired getting into this. So I want to describe a little bit more of the problem, quote unquote, that I saw that made me want to do this research. And that was students kind of hate research methods classes, at least in the social science and behavioral science realms where I play around. Um, I found that even before I was teaching research methods. So for example, when I started at Utah Valley and I was at a, just a student faculty meet and greet my first semester before I started teaching the methods classes, even though that was my, my goal, I was just chatting with some students and one of them brought up, oh yeah, I have to take some research methods this summer. Oh, it's gonna suck. And everyone was just going along with, with, oh, it's terrible. This is gonna be awful. And this was well before the students had actually had experience with it. This was just simply the narrative that they were telling themselves and telling each other about how terrible the class was gonna be. Then they turned to me, Dr. Rocha, what do you teach? Well, I'm gonna teach research methods, so that'll be fun. But it really kind of opened my eyes to, oh, maybe this is a phenomenon that's not just here amongst these students. And so I did some more reading and it is not just my students. Um, in research methods, literature in general, kind of in the social sciences, behavioral sciences area, again, it's been called the hardest class to teach, not because of the actual content, but because students are very resistant to it, just because they often do come in with these narratives that it's terrible, I'm gonna be terrible at it. It has lots of math and I hate math is another common aspect of this. And it was something that I really was kind of distressed by. And I, so I wanted to understand more about why they had these feelings and if we could do something to help. And so part of this was a theoretical side. I wanted to know the value or the relevance that students saw of this class, because I was definitely hearing statements about that. Why am I taking this? I want to be a therapist. I don't want to do research. Why am I taking research methods? And also an expectation of success or an expectation not to succeed. Um, people saying, you know, I am not going to do well at this. I already know I'm not going to. Together, these, I was thinking of them in, together as part of the expectancy value theory of motivation. And that's a theory that I used a lot in my dissertation to study a completely different thing, marriage and, and how people choose to get married. But it fits here too, to understand why students do certain things in class, why they have motivation to work at the class or not. Even if students have very high value of a class, even if they do think research methods would be important to them, if they have low expectations that they're actually gonna succeed, they're not gonna do very much for it. They already think that they're not gonna do well, so why try? Conversely, even if they think they could do it, if they have very low value for the class, then they're not gonna do much either. Uh, motivation really comes from having both a value placed on the thing that you want to achieve and expectation that you can succeed in some way. So those were two big things that I was really interested in understanding more. Another though was just the affect that the students had towards the class because I personally don't like torturing people. And so if there was a way that I could find out what would make the class less torturous, then that would be great. And so I wanted to understand that affect side. And that led to kind of this practical, I want to know what factors are the students themselves seeing as being helpful or hurting their relevance, their expectations of success and their affect towards the class. Now in all research, I believe it's very important to really understand who the researcher is because in all kinds of research, we bring ourselves into it. We bring our biases, our expectations, our experiences and, but qualitative research, I see this even more so. And so I think it's important for me to step back and recognize that for one, I was a bit of an odd student myself as an undergraduate because research methods was the class I was most looking forward to. I had already been involved in a, a student research team. And so when I got to the class, I got to see it all in action. And I was just very excited. So when I heard my students talking about how much they despised it, it was very foreign to me. 
Um, the other thing to note here is that I am a quantitative researcher by training. My doctorate training was all in family demography with specializations in quantitative science. So this is very uh, out there for me to be doing this qualitative research, but I've always wanted to become a mixed methods researcher. So I am very open to your feedback. I want to leave plenty of time for discussion here so that if you have ideas for me or other places where you think I should be going with this, I would love to hear that. So what is this study? The current study is an analysis of metacognitive journals in my research methods classes. So I started using journals when I was teaching behavioral science research methods, so a broader research methods class in spring of 2020, and we all know what happened that semester. So I started in in-person classes and I used metacognition. It was a very new concept to me, but I was trying to implement it into some of my in-class exercises. When we moved to emergency remote instruction, though, I knew that I needed something more solid where the students could assess kind of how they were doing, see some of their wins and elucidate some of their struggles. And then I could see that and, and potentially help if I could. So I started using metacognitive journals and I really liked it. It seemed to work very well in helping me see where the students were and helping them actually hit on some new discoveries themselves. So I made it a formal assignment in my summer research methods class, which was behavioral science again. And then in the fall, I started teaching family science specific research methods, which I think was a, even more of a shift towards people saying, why am I doing research methods? Family science students often come to the major because they don't think it has math and because they think that it's going to be much more touchy feely and that's what they want because they've had some bad experience with statistics or research in some form. And so I run into even more of this like, I don't know why you're making me do this kind of thing. So for this study, I am using, I'm analyzing everything in text, but they could record the journals. So I've transcribed many of these. I only have the data from August, 2020 for this particular presentation right now, which is four cases, but it still gives over 20,000 words. And I think will be, uh, it starts illuminating some of the themes that I think will come up later as well. The method I'm using is a frenetic iterative analysis. Uh, popularized by Sarah J. Tracy. It is kind of like grounded theory where when you're looking at the data, you're allowing themes to emerge, you're doing some open coding passes and then some more focused coding things. But the hallmark of this method is that it's a constant dance between data and literature. So there's a back and forth constantly. You do a little bit of coding, you do some more reading. You take what themes you've just discovered in, in your new reading, see if it shows up in the data. You take what themes you've just found from your data and see if it shows up in the literature, back and forth, back and forth until you've found kind of your narrow um, new information or some confirmation of what you've been reading. So that's what I'm using here. I've only done very preliminary open coding to start with, but I think it, it shows where this can go. So the results so far. I've identified eight big themes that have really started to come out from these first four cases. And these are negative feelings about the class, which I expected, personal traits that the students attribute these negative feelings and experiences to, um, tools and strategies that the students say they will use and that they have used, a collection of positive things, pride, confidence, and an overall kind of comfort slash positive regard that the students hold for the class, especially towards the end of the semester, hopes for the future and their continued learning of research. And also in the journals, they often will reference explicitly learned knowledge that they bring up into the journal. So I wanna give a few examples of these different themes. So for negative feelings, for example, at the beginning of the semester in their week one prompt, I have one of the, one. Of, this is one of the questions. How are you feeling about the class right now? And I have in parentheses there, you can be totally honest because I want them to understand that these journals are not, not grading them based on how happy they are about the class. I'm just, it's just something I want them to do because it's good for them and it allows me to see what they're doing. One student summed it up very well. They said, overwhelmed in all caps. Another student was a little more verbose, but described a similar feeling. I think this class will absolutely be a struggle for me. I'm pretty scared and I worry about my ability to be successful. So this immediately draws on that expectancy value theory and suggests that this student really doesn't see themselves doing well in the class. So I probed a little bit more because I, I really thought they could be successful and thankfully this is a, is a success story, but this beginning uh, kind of reflection I think illustrates what I was expecting to find. Students, like I said, immediately had 
traits that they attributed these things to. Some of this was the major. So student three said, like I mentioned, I'm not super excited about this. I am more in it, the, the major, for the relationship and helping side of things rather than the research side of things. People are my passion, so I enjoy communicating with and helping people rather than researching and studying people. And then student one who described this feeling of that they won't be successful delved into a little bit more and described why they themselves would feel this way. They say, I am someone who can find themselves overwhelmed when I look at things as a whole, which led nicely into the next theme that I identified, which was students bringing up tools and strategies, both that they could use. So early in the semester, talking about what they think they would use. And then throughout the semester, talking about what they were finding helpful. I don't have quotes here because I just wanted to sum up some of the, the major pieces that came out from the tools and strategies, but the class qualities were often something that the students brought up. So my no penalty extensions in this class, students just have to email and say, this is the assignment that I need some more time on. Here's when I'm gonna have it in. So they really appreciated that, the ability to kind of form it around their life. The library resources that I've incorporated into the class and the fact that we have a subject librarian who is dedicated to our major and is incredibly helpful. The students often referenced using the library resources. The fact that the assignments are almost always turned in at least once if not twice in draft form so that even though their research proposal that, turn, that is turned in at the end of the semester is a very large beast of an assignment, they do it in many little pieces and so they appreciated the ability to get feedback along the way. And then finally, they talked about being able to communicate with me. This was a fully online asynchronous class. And I know that that poses its own challenges sometimes to student motivation and success. And so the students often described feeling very glad that I respond very quickly to email, that I give them a lot of feedback. This is also interesting to note in the context that I never respond to email at night or on weekends. And I make that very clear to my students at the beginning of all classes, and they've never had a problem with that. So this was something that students brought up. Um, some of the positives that students noted, especially towards the end of the semester, but even early when given the opportunity, they would talk about what had gone well. So student one, again, the student that initially felt very uh, hopeless, said, as the semester progressed, I started to realize this was something I could actually do and enjoy doing. So this is another theme that I feel is starting to emerge, which is myself as a researcher. People students seeing themselves as, you know, maybe I could do this. Um, it's kind of a novel idea for some of them. This student was less exuberant, but said, um, I think it went okay. I think it didn't go as well as I probably could have done, but um, I think it was good. So this was a student who identified more of these personal traits and said, you know, I didn't achieve everything I wanted to do and here's why, here's what happened. This is all in the context of COVID. So I think that's its own unique part of this study. But they said, you know, overall, I accomplished what I was hoping to. It was, that was okay. And then this student, student two, this was the overwhelmed student from the beginning. They said, I think I was most proud really allowing myself to learn things that I didn't want to. I was proud that I was able to give quantitative research a fair shake and not really run away from it. So we do both quantitative and qualitative research in the class, but the quantitative stuff is almost always the worst for the students because that's where the math comes in and the math anxiety that a lot of them bring. This student, I think, summed up well the balance of the challenge of the class, but being able to find that it was relevant and find ways that it applied to their life. So they said, this class was honestly great. Did it stretch me in a lot of ways? Yes. I feel like it was a lot of work. Definitely one of my hardest classes of the semester, although very challenging at times. It did help me grow and realize new things. So where do I want to take this? Well, my next step for this project is to return to the literature while I await more data to come in. So the spring classes are obviously in going right now. I won't know who has consented until the end of the semester. I've set it up that way. So we'll see what kind of data I have after that. And I'm also slowly starting to transcribe the summer and spring data, which I have approval from my IRB to treat as secondary data. Um, but I want to return to the literature and see which of these themes really show up already. That communication with the professor, for example, is one that I have seen in communication research in, in research methods with their students that having a professor who gives a lot of feedback, who is responsive. I mean, the qualities that we all know already are good for professors to have um, seem particularly helpful in these types of contexts where a class is very intimidating or they don't see the relevance of it um, initially.
So that's one of these themes, but I wanna look back at the literature and kind of find out more where my findings are fitting, where they're a little bit different. Again, the family science context may be a little bit different um, and then return to my data and continue that dance. So thank you very much for being here. I, I, we have some time, so I'd love to hear your thoughts anywhere else you think that I should be taking this. Um, family science is very interdisciplinary. So if you have other literatures that you think I should be reading, I'd love to hear that. And I am happy to continue this conversation. You can find me on Twitter at Rachel Orocho, or you can email me rachel.orocho at udu.edu. So thank you all so much. We got about five minutes left. You've got a question from Sherry. She asks, how do you deal with the conflict of interest you are the re researcher and the teacher. You're probably dealing with some social desirability in the student comments. I think that is probably part of it. I will absolutely give you that, but I do get some still some very negative comments um, and I in the journals. And I think that may come from me trying to be very, very open with them. And I start that, you know, in the first week with that, you can be honest kind of thing. But I also um, am very big on self-disclosure from both sides. If I'm asking them to disclose like this, I disclose from my side as well. So one of our very first activities in the class, even before they start receiving grades on anything, is an introduction where they tell me about themselves, you know, what do they want me to know, things like that. But then I also give them a space and I say, okay, I'm you're sharing with me, I want to share with you, what do you want to know about me? And they'll ask me some fairly personal things, you know, what do you most dislike about this class? Or what do you find hardest? Or, you know, things like that. And I Try to open a dialogue with them very early and so these journals do get pretty uh personal for many of them sometimes they will express you know i cried this week while i was doing the journal or while i was doing this module because i just cannot understand the difference between these two things or man these quizzes are really stupid i've, I've had students who got really upset with the journal and so in the journal it'll say things like i'm really tired of filling in this journal but i know that i should fill it in so i'm filling in the journal like so i feel like they do get pretty real in them, which I'm, I am glad for. Does that convince you though? Do you have other thoughts on that, Sherry? Um, yeah, this is Sherry. I teach research too, and I get those kind of comments too. <laughs> yeah. Some people just hate it. Some people actually like it and get better. And I'm not saying you shouldn't ask those questions because I get great feedback to help me be a better teacher, believe me. I'm just okay. thinking that when you go to publish this, how you're going to have to declare that as a limitation, probably. But I'm Definitely. not saying don't do it. I'm just saying here we are teaching research and we understand the limitations of research and we're living them, you know. Absolutely. So, that is a great point. More power I to appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts, questions? I, I have a question. Um, because we, I teach a lot of freshman researchers, and I'm curious about that sort of research identity. Have there been particularly things that you found helpful as you're trying to help students sort of change that self identity that they can do research? I've that's been one of the most new themes that I've seen. So I haven't made an explicit connection yet, but I've had students. Uh, one of the points that sticks out is students who say, I didn't realize research didn't have to be numbers. I could really do this qualitative stuff. Like that's literally suddenly this, this switch flips and they're like, I have always wanted to ask questions. I just didn't want to deal with the stats. And so I, I think that may be playing a role in some of these students' attitude change. All right, we've got one minute left. I've put in the um, evaluation link in the chat. So if you'll fill out the evaluation for Rachel, it'd be appreciated. Thank you so much, everyone. This was fun. Thank you. 
Thanks, Daryl. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Anton, thank you for that comment.